Good morning. Welcome to the month of May. Uh, my name is Jay Leesk. I'm very excited to, to be here with my usual cohorts. Nobody is absent. Uh, the M365 Government Community Call. Rima, Sarah, Sarah, Jeremy. I almost did it. You almost did it. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen both of you on screen. I forget what it's like. Oh, no. <laughs> it's already started. <laughs> We are Sarah me. There we go. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, um, it's been an extremely busy month. We've had a few, um, not career changes, but gr opportunities of growth in our careers. Um, my family's just coming off of COVID quarantine uh, this past week. You know, last month we had um, uh, Erica Telly from Microsoft come and talk to us about records management in Microsoft 365. And this past week... Um, one of the big information management conferences in the United States, the AIM conference just happened, which I was so excited to go to until COVID quarantine kept me home. Um, so I was really excited to be able to bring that news to the, to the meeting. And of course, that's not happening. But following last week, we're continuing the records and information management conversation uh, with our good friends from the National Archives. Before we get into that, let's jump into the community events. Jeremy, you want to kick us off? Yeah, so May 7th, coming up soon, is the DC Power Platform user group. Uh, they have uh, actually they have two events this month. I'll, I'll speak to the first one. Jay can speak to the second. So they're going to have an in-person networking meetup um, here in the DC area. There, um, there's a training going on by uh, an organization called TechFluent, and they wanted to meet with the local uh, Power Platform group. So that's a awesome opportunity to encourage people who are coming into their early careers in the Power Platform. Yeah, that's really great. I, I love I, I love that in-person stuff is starting to come back. Um, as long as everyone is being smart and healthy, it's very exciting. Uh, on May 11th, so actually the, the one that you just announced happened already, unfortunately. Um, but the other one is on May 11th. Uh, the usual monthly, uh, monthly user group meeting uh, is going to be about power virtual agents in Dataverse for Teams. Uh, lots happening on Teams for... Um, you know, custom apps that you might be building for mission mission focused apps. So uh, really should check that out. Um, and then a couple of TBD on topics, um, but usual in the DC area, the SharePoint user group of DC is meeting in two days on the 12th. Um, and then uh, the Azure government meetup, that one is still just up in the air TBD, just stay tuned on their, uh, their meetup page for any updates. They'll usually drop that in and let you know. I'm guessing later in the month. Yeah. Uh, in a, um, a very long time from here, but starting uh, July 26th and 27th, will be Summit 7's CS2 in DC. Nice. Um, and that is focused on CMMC. Uh, also on May 10th is the Ability Summit. Yeah, the Ability Summit's really cool. It's an accessibility conversation uh, for, I assume, focused on Microsoft 365. Um, the CMMC, the Summit 7 Cloud Security and Compliance Series is awesome. Um, they've been doing in-person around the country uh, for a little while. Um, 
over the last year. And so I'm very excited to see that come to DC. Hopefully we'll see uh, a little bit more government participation than we have seen um, in Tampa, I think was the last one. Rima, do you want to kick us off on the roadmap update? I think it's all in your name, so you can just spin (laughs) right through it. It's all teams. Um, So I don't know if folks have had a chance to take a look at the April What's New in Teams blog. I'll, I'll, I'll say this again. I know I say it all the time, but we do have a massive government section, like government only. It's like VIP access, right? All the way at the bottom. And there is so much stuff. Like, I'm going to try to run through this quickly so that I don't eat up like speaker time, but it, this is amazing. So um, I'll start off with GCC. So we now have this attendance dashboard. So essentially you can measure meeting participation. So after a meeting, you can go into the, att- like click on the attendance data, see the attendance dashboard. I know that's so important, especially for government to know who came and who didn't. Um, So just check that out, make sure you don't miss it. Um, We also have uh, webinar capabilities now. So it's a new type of meeting in GCC. So whenever you try to schedule a new meeting from within the Teams client, um, you have that drop down menu and now you have a new option called webinar um, and it allows um, up to a thousand attendees. Um, We also have GCC invite only meeting options. It's a little confusing to to describe, but basically let's say you forward an Outlook calendar event to other folks and you you, you don't know who's who's been forwarded to. Essentially, if you own that meeting and all the forwarded people come into that meeting, you as a meeting host can control who actually comes in or not, which is really cool. So you can forward the meeting, you know, folks can forward the meeting if they want to, but at least like you as the owner have the 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 capability and the security to say who can come in and who can't. So that's that's really, really cool. Um, in GCC High, we now have a large gallery and together mode in Teams meetings for the web. Woohoo! And for VDI as well, which might be like a lesser woohoo audience, but <laughs> <laughs> You don't know, Um, or I don't know at least. Um, And then for GCC High and DOD, we have voice enabled Teams channels. Okay, why does this matter? Let's say you have a call center or help desk or something like that. Essentially, you can have that team channel be voice enabled for a group of people. So that's really cool. So they can actually have a call queue um, Mm -hmm. in that channel. So that's kind of a neat, neat scenario. Another really neat scenario for GCC High and DOD is the ability to modify roaming bandwidth. So let's say, for example, you might be in an area with a low bandwidth situation or restricted bandwidth area in general. That could never happen right now. (laughs) And essentially admins would have the capability to control control that. So, you know, what happens and what doesn't in those areas. That's really cool. And finally, I wanna say the biggest thing that I know DOD folks are gonna be jumping up and down for, for joy, is now you can have up to 25,000 members per team in a DoD team. What? Insane. Insane. Awesome. It, that is insane. I still can't <laughs> believe people put 25,000 people in a single team. Yeah, you never know. I mean, that's a different conversation all about adoption, and I'm sure we'll have another one of those episodes in the near future. If you want a deeper dive on any of these features, um, my my monthly update on This Week in Teams um, we, we, we have recorded a slightly longer section talking about some of these things. Um, so Thank feel you. free to go check that out. Um, but that's enough, uh, of, uh, self-promotion. Sarah, <laughs> uh, are there a couple news items, uh, from the community as well that you want to cover today? Yes. Uh, so we have the, um, second in the Brian, uh, Turch, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. A uh, blog series on um, helping federal organizations achieve CDM requirements on software asset ma- asset management. You need to pronounce that one correctly. <laughs> and also, we have an update on uh, Microsoft Sentinel's CMMC 2.0 workbook. It is super cool. Um, it's by authors uh, Lily Davudian De- and uh, TJ Banasik. So please go check it out. Um, the blog will be linked below and the video that they made together for that as well as embedded. Cool. All right. Uh, light news month, April, uh, April did not produce as much as I thought it was going to, but that's okay. That just means more time for the meat and potatoes of this week's of this month's session, uh, (laughs) which is a continuation as mentioned about records management for Microsoft 365. Um, 
So this month, um, following last month's discussion on the technology side, this month we're very excited to have a discussion on the policy side. Uh, and joining us today are Lisa Haralampis, uh, the Director of Records Management Policy and Outreach for the National Archives, and Beth Cron, the Electronic Records Management Policy Analyst for, for NARA as well. Lisa, uh, Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you for having us. It's wonderful to be here. Our pleasure entirely. So every month we we try to bring topics to the conversation um, that are really um, uh, hot on everybody's mind when it comes to how do we use Microsoft 365 successfully. Uh, and so often we're having a very technical discussion, but as we have said from month to month, the tech is only part of it. A big part of it is also, you know, consideration for the policy side of things. How should we use the system? Not just how can we, but how should we? And how do we teach people to do that? Um, and so uh, when your names came across my desk, I was really excited. First of all, Lisa, uh, the first time I saw you, um, I, 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 I want to tell this story because it made me so happy. It was at 930 Gov. You were uh, you were giving a presentation on records, and M365 was still very new in everyone's minds. Nobody had figured out how to do NARA compliance for it, and you were talking about policy as you do. And I got up and got to ask a question, and I asked oh. you because Teams was brand new. I asked you about Teams chats and whether or not Teams chats should be considered a record, and and you gave a wink to the room and and. You, you pointed out that, was it used in making a decision about how to do our business? <laughs> then it's a record. Um, that's, that's clearly Ooh. oversimplified, but that will forever uh, live in my memory because that was a great moment. Because everyone always says those aren't records. And I'm like, okay, I'm sure they're not. Let's ask the professional. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jay, that's that's a wonderful story because I'm always worried when somebody starts that way. I'm like, please tell me I got the answer right. I, <laughs> I was please tell me. I was like, oh, would I, I think I would still say the same thing. And that story is perfectly illustrative of going back to um, for me email. So I've um, been around. I feel like for a while, and I remember conversations happening in the '90s. Like, don't worry, email's not a record. Like, no way, it'll never take the place. It's not how people use it. So when you see chats and other things and people being like, this ain't a record. And you're like, really? Just the way I've, I've heard this story before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah re electronic communication used to conduct business between individuals. Recorded information used uh, between individuals to conduct business. That's, I think, the legal definition. Yep. of an electronic message and electronic messages are records <laughs> so now everybody in your podcast is probably paying closer attention wait what we have to manage what <laughs> that's right that's right well listen uh, again beth lisa thank you so much for joining us i want to start out with uh, a little bit um about the business of nara um you know your your job is not simply to store permanent records you you help to define policy but in doing that you partner with more than just other agencies. Can you talk a little bit about how you engage with and partner with the, the industry to actually ensure that the government can manage their records? Absolutely. Um, let, if it's okay, Beth, I'll just start just a little bit of scene setting and then we can talk about some specifics. We've said this, our story is, boy, were we really good in the 90s and 2000s about talking about what people have to do. And by people, specifically, what do federal agencies, federal records, agency records officers, federal records staff, the contractors supporting them, what do you have to do? And we would describe about all the goals, all the what's. You must manage records. You must provide, ensure access to records. You must retain them. You must, must, must. And we started getting questions like, oh, yeah, no, no, we, we got it. We know what we must do. How do we do it? And that was a hard thing for us at NARA to sort of move into that space because you, the requirements are the same for all federal government agencies, all Federal Records Act agencies. But there's a huge difference between DOD, the Army, uh, you know, Department of Justice, FBI, everybody's mission, everybody's size. It applies to commissions, which may have 20 people to 
moderate or small agencies and budgets are tight. Tools were always, you know, very uh, sometimes home built, home grown, home crafted. So we have been trying to move into a space where we're able to provide more help. And we couldn't do that by ourselves unless we partnered with a lot of um, agent, a lot of other agencies and other groups. So that's my send up. And Beth, you might want to talk about our first partnership, I'm assuming, with GSA. Yes, we've partnered with uh, the General Service Administration, GSA, in a couple of different areas. Uh, the first one was in defining our requirements for electronic records management. And so we've been working with the Unified Shared Services Management Office uh, at GSA to build electronic records management requirements into shared services. And so to do that, we've been, we're nearly there on completing our federal integrated business framework. That is um, a framework that's used across all uh, service areas such as financial management, travel, grants management, where we put records management into that same framework so that it could be, um, you know, kind of plug and played into the other, other areas as well. And so we are working on finishing up our service measures. We recently shared those for public review. So we try to engage with vendors in that way and say, hey, we've got these standards out. We'd love for you to take a look at them. Do they make sense? Um, at the same time that we share it with other agencies. And then um, we're working with all those shared services, um, even at the level of uh, looking at their use cases. For example, in real property, we're looking at, it looks like you're creating a record here and it, the general record schedule would apply there. So we're working on that. Um, and then we're working with another office at GSA and the multiple award schedule office. And so the idea with uh, the shared services is that you'd have an FIBF, uh, the framework, and then you'd actually have a marketplace where there are vendors that, um, that meet all of the requirements and can provide those services. So we don't exactly have a marketplace in the, the QSMO, the Quality Services Management Office way, but we do have uh, an electronic records management special item number on the multiple award schedule. And uh, we have vendors on that list who self-certify that, and Offpoint is one of those, the self-certify that they meet the universal electronic records management requirements. And so we've had um, a great working relationship with them. Um, we've been able to meet with vendors and we answer questions. And so if you send a, an email, we will meet with you and answer your questions. And uh, that's been a really productive group. And also the, the multiple word schedule team started an ERM working group in the procurement space. And now they're working on a mock procurement with both vendors and agencies and kind of going through that process and seeing um, where all the records management requirements fit. So we've had uh, kind of those different ways. And then uh, also partnering with industry, uh, we've gotten involved in this Microsoft 365 space. And so we will share concerns that we hear from agencies with Microsoft and I've also participated with other colleagues on the Microsoft's customer advisory board for records management so that I can talk more about that. But that's been um, it's been a great opportunity to talk to other organizations around the world and hear what their concerns are and we can share ours. So don't tell Microsoft their concerns. Tell us so we can fill the hole. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I will just say. It's lovely to be to hear the, some of the reasons why we hear from so many different people and why we're happy to be here today is, well, Nara says, and I use air quotes for those who are listening, Nara says, it's easy to perhaps, you know, as you go to apply the requirement, am I applying it the right way? Am I meaning what Nara says? So I'm happy, we're always happy to answer, what did Nara say? And yes. we always are willing to talk and explain, what did you mean by this requirement? Because as you said, for Microsoft and where we are, it's, a, it's an ever changing landscape. So you're always reinterpreting um, our requirements in new, in new ways. 
can can I just insert with like a really quick story? So sorry, this is like so when I worked at White House, I worked um, in the National Security Council, and you know I, I helped manage SharePoint stuff uh, there. And it was so funny. We would get into screaming matches about like well, is this going to work for NARA or not? Like, we would, like, literally, like, argue and, like, how we planned everything was really focused around NARA. So this is, like, bringing back some, like, fond memories of, like, having, like, these technical deep dive, like, arguments with folks just to be sure that we were meeting meeting your guidelines. So I'm I'm very appreciative. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much. I, I am, I like the space I work in, the same space we all work in, federal records management. It's fascinating. Presidential records management is also fascinating in a different way. Mm -hmm. Everything comes to the National Archives. It's all permanent. <laughs> Imagine a schedule with one retention period. Save it all, um, which is, you know, uniquely challenging and, and something we look forward to. We at the National Archives manage those presidential records. And we get them, unlike federal records, if you think about it, most of our records aren't transferred to us. Earliest is usually 15 years, yeah. 25, 30 is more regular. Those presidential records, they come on January 21st at noon on that like, date. You're like, it's fast. So I like to look at what our colleagues do on that side of the house. Yeah. Because whatever they're doing, whatever tools we need to manage the most recent presidential administration records are the same tools we're going to need on the federal side, you know, 10 years later. So um, and it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice fit. But yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have lots of stories to share. Yeah, I love you're saying that like people were screaming at you, Rima, and they're, you're like, those are such fond memories. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. You know, this is so weird. Like, come on. But we all cared so deeply. It was like passionate, like arguing. That's why, like, sorry. So we all loved it. We all cared about it. And we, we would plan all of our technology around that. So that's, it was just cool. Anyway, okay, I'll stop that. Yeah, and it's a good case study, but it has very different policy implications for how it actually plays out when you're keeping everything. And we've heard things like, you know, some functionality is not available to them for those reasons. For example, chat. So yep. it can play out very differently. Uh, leading into that, how is NARA handling the ever-changing technological landscape with things like Microsoft Teams? Yes, oh, I that is a good question, but... Yeah. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a wonderful uh, policy-related question of what do you do? Because we kind of just alluded to the fact nothing stays the same and every implementation you can kind of really get into. What do we mean by this? So I would say, how does NARA deal? How does NARA handle? Those are probably different questions, aren't they? From our perspective, where we sit, so Beth and I, you know, as federal records management policy analysts and policy experts, we try to create a framework, a policy framework that is tool agnostic. So if you look at our requirements or you look at what we say, I kind of mentioned a few minutes ago, records have to be created, identified, captured, maintained, uh, access provided according to controls. And then in the big, big, big thing we talk about is disposition. I love disposition. Can I get to hitting the delete key? Um, that life cycle and that policy, we try to make agnostic so it works no matter how the technology changes. But then you have to always be looking at your policy saying, is the landscape changing this? I thought the Microsoft and the Teams question is, we've been looking at it. So let me let me just start first. That's our, that's our framework. We have our basic policies and law, and then we look at how the technology um, applies. I thought one of the interesting ways to look at this is social media guidance and social media policy. It may not be what folks are thinking about right now, but in 2013, so almost uh, nine years, 10 years ago, we wrote a white paper on social media where we researched, okay, what is this thing? What are people doing? And then we sort of look at the research and then compared it to records management requirements. So we actually have a NARA bulletin on social media that was, I think, published in 14. So it's like we did the research, then we wrote some guidance and that guidance was just to help answer questions on that basic, this is what you have to do, but what do I do with social media records? And so I think when we talk about the changing landscape, that's our, that's our operational mode. Research, look, think about it. Is there something new that we have to say or something new we have to say on like an, from an, from an implementation? So I thought the social media was a good example of, of how we do agnostic policy, but then try to provide more information. I think one of the hardest things with the ever-changing technology landscape is staying abreast and staying aware of what's changing. 
We are so lucky. We work in policy. So we have a little bit of a chance to like look out and read what's happening. Um, For people who might be interested, one of the things that we do, it's not policy related, but we're we're looking at research, right? We want to look at what technologies are out there and then think about records management implications. Mm -hmm. So we've written white papers. They're available on our website. We'll give you a link to those papers. We wrote one on um, blockchain. That was in 2019. And hopefully there are many people here who are part of like blockchain for gov and are like, oh, I'm, I'm familiar with that. We try to do the research and then add a little insight to records management, right? That's our part that we can provide to that space. So we looked at blockchain. We also looked at um, cognitive technology. We grouped in a bucket called it called t- cognitive technology, machine learning, AI, um, robotic processing. Like how could that create records? Or how could that be used to manage records? And so it's not guidance per se, but we can tell what we're thinking about. And that helps us do our job thinking about what do we need to issue a new policy. And right now we are researching, hopefully will come out this summer, um, quantum computing, quiz. Like, is that going to be impacting? So that's the sort of thing we look at. I would love to hear from your community if there's like major emerging technology that we should be looking at in other spaces. Um, yeah. It's actually more fun parts of the job, really, is to go out and learn something new and think about how the government's using it and think about the implications. So it's a lot of, so that's how we, we try to stay abreast. I mean, when you said social media, too, I immediately like was thinking of all the social platforms. And then I'm like thinking of like, you know, a member of Congress doing a TikTok dance to information or something. I'm not really sure how that would be. <laughs> right. well, but you can. never know. <laughs> You're absolutely right, because it's like when we talk about social media, we call it shorthand Web 2.0. So you're like, oh, it's Web 2.0. What happens if you blog? Oh, no head of agency will ever blog. You know, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, or, you know, how what happens if you're having a robust discussion with comments with the public? Like, I think it's, a, again, Jay, is this the same question you heard? I think it's a good idea for the federal government to know what it says. That's like an underlying policy for records management. Because people are listening and they're going to know what you said. So if you're speaking in this public space, how long do you need to keep a record of that? You know, that's, that's, we can, now we're having records management fun. That I yeah. love those questions where you're like, oh, how long should we keep that? Yeah. But yeah we, I mean, you think yeah. about it, some of these platforms are rising, like, and more and more people are using it. So whether or not people think they're players in the game, they are. They are. Yes, they are. And that's for the traditional, right? We haven't even, we can talk about the other, uh, Landscape that worries me, which is ephemeral messaging, apps that are designed to delete automatically. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that one's an easy policy. Again, no, you need to know there's a problem. There's a records management problem, but it's really a business problem. You do need to know what you're saying. And if you use ephemeral messaging technology, there needs to be discussion about why and how is it appropriate? Are we creating um, that the best tool that we need to use? But also on the other hand, Beth and I, we talk about this all the time. It's hard. We at NARA want to preserve the records that created. We don't tell people how to create records. So we're in that space. If that's the tool you need, how do we make it so you can use it? It's very, uh, it's very tricky, very tricky question. We don't know the answers. We're exploring mm. it. I think. That's, a, that's an interesting, interesting point. So I'm, I'm a fellow government person like, like you and Beth. Yeah. And um, and so I asked those questions like that is a challenge when we have a technology get introduced into our environment, people start adopting it and then we realize, oh, crud, we can't we can't keep anything. There's no way to actually store a record or capture a record. Is that something people come to you uh, about a lot? I'm just curious. Yes. Yes, we do get those questions. And quite frankly, that's often I hate to say it. We have to bring in lawyers. Because you have to talk about well, what is it your legal requirements. Right. So it's because that's kind of where records management's based in law also. So it's really what is the legal requirement for your memory, for your documentation. And then we talk about what is this appropriate. And then whether it's appropriate or not, we have to talk about the impact of it because mm-hmm. there, it's 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 a genre that's emerging, right? And then you it really worries me. I'm like, well, what happens when everybody uses tools like these? Because it's um, effective government. Like records mm-hmm. management supports effective government. We don't get in the way of effective government. So it's hard. Right. It's a hard conversation. But yeah, we do yeah. hear them. And that's when you tend to get the, I think it qualifies as a record. It's important to say 
not every record means 20 year retention, right? It's right. it's a record for how long do you need to know you said it. Maybe it is appropriate to delete in 24 hours or two weeks. I mean, remember when email had 90 day automatic retention? Yep. Turned out that didn't work out too well, but there was that idea that it's possible you could have had that philosophy. So we'll see what happens with that space. Yeah. Right. Something then, to think, something to watch. Go ahead. And then we talk about what makes a complete record. Like if we, if you are capturing those, are they actually good records? Do we have like the basic bare minimum of who sent it? What was it about? What time it was sent? You know, that minimum metadata. Yeah. Getting some feedback. Yeah. Oh no. Getting that. Yeah, so yeah. this is fascinating to me. Records management and security, I think, are my two favorite topics from a policy perspective because the users often see both of them as roadblocks to success. Whereas, like you just said, it you, that's not you're not trying to be a roadblock. You're just trying to make sure that we are capturing the information we need to capture. Security side too. Um, we had uh, MCC CISO on here a few months back, maybe a year ago, and and we talked about the fact that the CISO's job, the security team's job, is to not be a roadblock, but to enable you to be successful securely. Right. Like if if we don't look at both of these as supporting, we're we're completely missing the boat. So I'm so glad to hear you say that. And I think there is an intersection between records management requirements and security requirements. There's a couple of touch points where, you know, nothing is more secure than deleting, right? If I no longer have to manage this, I don't have to think about the access and controls over the the risk. But on the other end, I think, yeah, so there's some of those nexus where we can have like discussion between what's a records requirement and what's a security requirement but boy do i try to stay in my lane because that security uh, aspect is is very is, i think it has so many challenges it's fascinating and i we have enough on our plate just with records but yeah we should we should have more conversation about how they intersect yep. yeah absolutely and i'm thinking lately about like what are the implications for records management of zero trust and what yeah. that's going to mean for how people do their work and manage their records and what that might look like. We might see more limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the zero trust and that I believe comes along for me, makes me think of also like identity management and how critical that is for records management because we do care about who said what when. So the identity management piece of security is also really helpful for us to be like, yes, that was the Beth Cron and the Lisa Heron Lampus who had yes. that conversation, not those other two that are out there. <laughs> so uh, working at, obviously at Microsoft, I'm very interested in how, and if, the, if this is happening today, how NARA requirements and policies are potentially driving changes to M365. Um, I know Jeremy has talked a lot about adaptive scopes before. Like, is that something that you all kind of drive or partner with, with industry to say, how do you change your technologies? To, to match our needs, is it is it a partnership with with Microsoft and NARA, or is it you all kind of coming to us and saying, hey, we, we recommend these changes? I'm interested to know a little bit about that. I'll frame it. We, we do have some things we've talked about technically, but if we can come up with the requirements, then I feel that it's a conversation of the implementation. For Microsoft and the federal government, I see a lot of Microsoft, um, the word is the right word, the Microsoft government customer representative talking to that client, that contract, you know, which version do you have, right? Uh, I, got, I got G5 over here and E3 over here. And I, on this, you know, uh, platforms, they kind of have to try to help tailor that. What we would do in ours is talk about, for me, this is my message. How can Microsoft do records management behind the scenes automatically so the people who are using the system focus on their mission? When that gets into, I think, a lot of the ways that it's configured. So I'll stop there, Beth. Ways it's configured. How would those ways be again? Okay, so yeah, we're talking about um, aligning with other organizations. So the big thing that we have is our Microsoft 365 user group. And we hear a lot from agencies about um, the challenges they're facing, the things that are working, and the things that they would like to see different 
and the tools. And like Lisa said before, we have a wide spectrum of agencies. They are in different government clouds. They are using different licensing. And so there's really um, a spectrum of, of where they are. And then another issue is that you've probably talked about is kind of the many agencies in one tenant. And so they don't have always the level of control that they need to actually implement the functionality that's there. Um, maybe going against or with kind of the actual design of the framework. So um, we've been talking with other national archives and there's been a lot of international interest in records management in Microsoft 365. And we've been working with the um, Information and Records Management Society out of the UK. Um, we participate in a lot of working groups and, and other meetings that they pull together. And we're, we're playing the role of describing our statutory and regulatory framework because it's not the same for every um, national archives around the world. We all have, uh, I'd say we all have the basics. We want to preserve records that need to be preserved. We want to export them from the system. We want to have good metadata, but um, we may differ in how long we want audit logs to be kept or if we need um, to keep track of if something's been disposed of. So there are differences, but I think by able by coming together and being able to talk about all of those, we've been able to let Microsoft know what kind of functionality is needed. And I'd say that the adaptive scopes came out of those discussions. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how agencies will be implement that, uh, specifically with NARA's capstone policy and how that could work for email and uh, possibly beyond into the electronic messages space as well. So, um, yeah, that's been uh, really interesting. We're watching what they're doing with multi-stage disposition. I mean, as you know, this these things are fairly new and federal agencies uh, work at the pace they work. So we're, <laughs> we'll see how uh, how it plays out in the, the next, the coming year. That's so cool. That's really, that's really interesting, Beth. So yeah, I, I'm a huge fan. Of, that's what they, that's what Remo was saying. I'm a huge fan of adaptive scopes because I was managing the policy at my last agency uh, for the retention rules for Capstone. And every single time somebody went into Tapscone, even temporarily, I had to go into the admin console, manually add them, right? And it's a lot of effort to track that and make sure the right people are in there at the right time. And now Adaptive Scopes is going to potentially make that easier with just a little bit of metadata on their user account. And it just happens magic, automatically in the background, right? So I, I just want to say as an encouragement to NARA that your engagement with industry is paying off for those of us who have to implement it techn te technically, right? Whether or not, you know, licensing, we have to have the right level of licensing and all that wonderful stuff, that, that that's a vendor problem, right? But in terms of what we get, if we if we put the investment into those technologies, uh, I appreciate how it makes the job easier. Mm -hmm. well, I like hearing that our efforts for the past 10 years to explore the how has somewhat helped. That, that's our goal, so thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of the of the user group. So I, I had started my own uh, ill-timed. I'd started my own uh, Microsoft 365 for government user group right before COVID. We had one meeting and then COVID happened and it so it didn't really grow. But once I learned about NARAs, I'm a huge fan. Uh, and so I've you know told everybody who used to go to, to mine who, who were dedicated to it, hey, come to the NARA one instead because we were all government people. Let's just add to the you know the growth of one that's been very successful. So that leads me to, to ask, how did you come about starting that user group? What was kind of the the reasons or the thought process that went into deciding to to, to uh, create that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it came out of uh, the Managing Government Records Directive, which was a NARA and OMB memo that came out 2012. So we're looking at 10 years ago, and that had uh, some guidance to NARA to form um, uh, a user group, uh, to form a community of interest around uh, improving automation for records management. And so that group formed, 
and we were searching around for topics. What are we talking about? Hmm, what's pressing in agencies? And we realized it was Microsoft 365. So it was about three years ago, I believe we transitioned that group to focus specifically on Microsoft 365. And I think at the time we had a lot of hesitation to say, oh, this is uh, this is tricky because we're not endorsing any specific tool. Uh, not all agencies are using it, but as we saw adoption really ramp up and the number of questions that were coming in from records officers kept going up and I was getting a lot of the same questions. So we decided to focus specifically on that. So I'd say it's not a technical group. We do talk quite a bit about policy and specifically the role of the records manager. But we do have folks from legal, procurement, IT. Um, my favorite is when a records officer says, I really want to invite my IT person so they can hear it straight from uh, straight from your group. And so that's uh, that's very exciting to me. So we have over 500 people on our mailing list, about 100 come each month. So it's and I really appreciate you, Jeremy, uh, sharing it. Um, we have a lot of things to talk about. I know um, Microsoft Teams is always one that people want to talk about. Um, advanced e-discovery and uh, we have just a, a we're always trying to build the list. But the presentations that people seem to like the best are agencies sharing what they're doing, uh, demos, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, folks always like to see what other agencies are doing and you know, we always want to encourage uh, sharing of resources, sharing of ideas, and so it's been a really good opportunity for that. Yeah, I was going to say to Beth, one of the things I like about that group is when people hear about it, they come to some meetings, it really can support you wherever you are. So you don't have to worry about like, I'm just starting to figure this out. Boy, do we have resources for you. Or you're like, I wanted to do this better. I thought, you know, I could come here and be like, oh, you actually sound like you're doing it wonderfully. Would you share your experience? <laughs> and so I think Beth, we've said it's .gov, correct? Like if anybody watching wanted yes. to come to those meetings on the, the where we host our resources on max.gov. I know, sorry, Jay. Oh, it's .gov is who you come. So if you're That's okay, but though. contractors with .gov emails that are supporting can attend. Yes. We, we try to make it as open as possible. Yeah, and, and a number of, uh, there are a number of contractors who come to that because they have .gov accounts that are directly supporting an organization. And mm -hmm. and yes, we we put the link out. We'll put the link out now in the chat. Um, I put it out every month because it, it even though you have to have a max.gov account, it's okay. That's who its intended audience is. Yep. So that's all right. right. No, no, I, I, I completely respect the restriction. And actually, uh, I'm more frustrated that I didn't think to use my contractor badge access that I probably had for about five months when I had it than I am that you have the restriction. So it's more frustration at myself than anything else. Awesome. So... Listen, this has been an amazing conversation about the, the capabilities of NARA in supporting records management um, from a policy perspective and from a technology perspective. There's one big question that I think everybody has that I'd like to, to kind of wrap with. Uh, and that question is, um, now that we are looking at electronic records as our primary base of records, what uh, what sort of plan does NARA have or, you know, the the pie in the sky, what we'd really like to see down the road? Thank you, Jay, for asking that question. I would say our one of the sh near term, you said short term, long term, also middle term sure. things we're looking about is cloud to cloud transfer. Right. We know Microsoft in the cloud agencies are storing in the cloud. I think it helps when you think of the National Archives and Records Administration. The problem is right in our name. We do the records administration part, and then we have to preserve the National Archives. That's not done in place. That usually involves transferring records to us so that we can keep them preserved, right? Digital preservation is our strategy, and we don't do that with the active records in the agency. So there has to be this transfer piece, but what does that look like? Um, in the past, and currently, we've done bulk transfer devices for getting the size of transfers that are coming and that we know will be coming. 
We are looking at cloud to cloud. We're doing one pilot right now with the census. So yes, for those of you who enjoyed uh, looking at NARA's census uh, 50 release that happened on April, we are piloting with the 20 census that was uh, taken to figure out how can we do a good job getting those that electronic data set. So it's, it's cloud to cloud is where we know we want to be. And how do we get there? So we were looking at our tools on our end, because when you think about it, if we're getting records, electronic records from so many different agencies, we have to do the basics. We have to do inventory, description. We have to process, which makes sure we know every file format and all the metadata that's in that. And we use that tool is our electronic records archive. So we're looking at improving the tools and the things we're doing to do electronic archiving. And we're looking to improve the ways agencies can do those transfers to us. That's our goal where we are now. One of the concerns I see us having more is um, encrypted records, uh, corrupted records, and how do we make sure that the records we have have that authenticity, that reliability, so that when we are able to provide them to the public, there's there's trust that the archives records are what we say. So I think that's our where where issues we're looking at and working on getting them and making them safe and then making them available. That's it. That's that's super exciting. As a records vendor and and technology partner in the space, we're very excited, anticipating the capability to eventually help with that automatic transfer. So, yeah. the, you know, as days move on, we're we're more months and years move on, but we're very excited to hear about the pilot, for example, with the census. Yeah. Yeah. My. So I, you asked about the positive, and I'm sorry I went a little negative, but you know, I also worry about the size and the volume. Like yes. what happens when they're too big to transfer? How do we provide that access? And will we in the future be looking at, there's data management, there's that information, there's all this, and what is the part that we want to preserve as our nation's history? I'm making a very small sign for those of you who are listening. It's a little, it's a very little amount that we might end up transferring because of the need of how we're going to preserve that. So it's, it's a really fascinating question. We want to, of course, save everything, but you can't. So then you have to start making those decisions on what is it that's appropriate and what format and how do we get it and how do we turn it around and make it accessible. It's a, it's a wonderful problem and I'm happy to be working on it with, with my colleagues at NARA and with the agencies that create them. Well, Lisa, Beth, we're very happy to have had this conversation with you. Thank you again so much for joining us and for sharing this information on the policy side uh, that we as technology professionals are so busily trying to solve on the tech side.